As you can see, today we're starting a new series, Peace, Love, and Happiness. And before I do that, though, I think I need to address recent events. You know, it is sad to me that once again I have to stand before you and decry and denounce violence perpetrated in our country by our fellow citizens. But here we are again. And just as I denounced violence on our streets last summer... I denounce the violence that we saw on the attack on our capital just a few days ago. Five people have lost their lives, including a Capitol police officer. Folks, this is unacceptable. It is un-American. It is ungodly. And we must not stand for it. We are a nation of law and order. And what we saw, regardless of anyone's political motivation was uncalled for, and it can't be tolerated. And I told you last Sunday that if 2020 taught us anything, it taught us to expect the unexpected. But I'm not too certain that everything that happened last week was wholly unexpected. For over four years now, conspiracy theories have been perpetrated by the left and by the right. And regardless of which side perpetrates conspiracy theories, we are discovering that they have real-world consequences. We are in dangerous times when we lose faith in each other, when we lose faith in our our political system, and we lose faith in God. We are living in dangerous times. And it's one thing for politicians and presidents to push conspiracy theories. It's another thing for Christians to do it. We cannot sacrifice the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ by perpetrating unfounded and dangerous rumors and falsehoods and allegations. You would not stand for it if people did that to you. But I see people freely share things on Facebook and share things with each other that are absolutely unfounded, no evidence whatsoever. And just because you read it on the internet doesn't make it true. I read once, Abraham Lincoln said, you cannot believe everything you read on the internet. (laughs) And I believe what that said. (laughs) Folks, we have got to pray. And in 10 days, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be the duly elected president and vice president of the United States of America. And like I have done since Ronald Reagan, whether it is a Republican president or a Democrat president, they will have my prayers And where possible, they will have my support without me compromising my Christian convictions. We are commanded in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, to pray for kings and everyone who is in high position. Pray for them so that we can live peaceable, godly lives. And the Bible says this is directly connected to the gospel of Jesus because it is God's desire that through our godly lives we can share the good news of Jesus and people will be saved from their sin. And if we don't watch it, we're going to allow partisan politics to divide our country even more so than it is now. And I'm calling on Christians. We need to pray like we've never prayed before. In fact, I'd like for us to do that now before I move into the sermon because the sermon is is something that we felt God leading us to, uh, to share months ago. But I think it is absolutely appropriate on this day after the events of last week that uh, we're going to find ourselves today talking about peace, love, and happiness. All right? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we are broken because we know that we have, we have lost faith in trusting you first and foremost. We have lost faith in seeking first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And God, we pray that as a nation, you would forgive us of that. Father, we pray for peace. We pray for unity. We pray, Father, for comfort for those who are grieving, loved ones they will never see again. Father, we pray for protection for our leaders and our fellow citizens because there are people who want to do harm. 
And Father, we pray for justice. We pray that if there are wrongs, they will be made right. If there are people or the people who have broken our laws, they will be brought to justice. And Father, we pray that we as the people of God would look to you like we've never done before and that you would bring revival. Let it start in our hearts. Let it start in the church. Let it start in our love for you and our love for our neighbor. And God, today we pray as our Lord taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, often people talk about the greatest. They want to know who's the greatest or what's the greatest. What's the greatest franchise in NFL history? Who's the greatest quarterback? Who's the, who's the greatest rock musician? Who's the greatest that ought to be brought into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame next? Who's the greatest preacher besides Ricky? Who, who, who's the greatest or what's the greatest? And sometimes I think that's great, and we ought to ask ourselves those kind of questions. In fact, sometimes we ask those questions when we start looking at our own lives and we want to order the priorities of our lives. What's the greatest priority that I need to focus on in this period of my life, maybe in my career or my family? What is the greatest job that I should focus on? What is the greatest obligation that, that weighs on my shoulders in this season of my life? And we're not the only ones to ask that question, what's the greatest or who's the greatest? There was a time in Jesus' earthly ministry, in fact, it was his last week before his crucifixion on the cross, that someone asked him about the greatest. And this particular person wanted to know what is the greatest commandment in all of Scripture. What is the greatest obligation that weighs upon us who believe in God and who want to live for him? And what I want to do is take you to how Jesus answered that question because the question he gave to that man in the first century applies to every single one of us in the 21st century today. I'm going to take you to the Gospel of Mark today, Mark chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 28 through 34, and we're going to see what the greatest expectation God has for us. What is the greatest obligation that God places on your life and mine and listen, we need to get our priorities right. And if we're going to get our priorities right, this has to be the beginning point. So I don't care if you're young or you're old, you're male or you're female, you're a member of our church or you're not. Getting your priorities straight, getting them right, begins with what Jesus teaches here in Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 28. Because God is going to lay out for us through Jesus' own lips our greatest obligation towards God and our greatest obligation towards each other. Mark chapter 12, verse 28, we come into the middle of a conversation. The scribes and the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of Jesus' day, were testing Jesus. They were trying to find evidence that they could use against him in a trumped-up trial to get him condemned by the Romans for insurrection. They're trying to get him charged by their fellow Jews with blaspheming God. And they're trying to turn the popularity of Jesus against him. They're trying to get the crowds to turn on him. So they keep trying one trick question after the other to trip him up. And like a skilled debater, Jesus answers the question so, so strongly, people are amazed so clearly that they can't argue with his answers. In fact, there's one particular scribe, and a scribe was a person who had a job in Judaism to study the Old Testament law of Moses, to write out the copies of the Old Testament law, and they knew it like the back of their hand. But there's one particular scribe who has become so amazed at the wisdom of Jesus that he no longer seeks to trick Jesus by posing a trick question to Jesus, 
He's come to realize, if I want good answers, if I want real answers, if I want answers from God to help me understand my scriptures better, I just need to ask Jesus. So here in Mark chapter 12, verse 28, we read this. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. The Pharisees and the scribes were arguing with each other about Jesus. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? You see, by this point in Judaism, we're way beyond the Ten Commandments now. In fact, in this point in Judaism, the scribes and Pharisees have identified 613 laws in the Old Testament that a good, pious Jew was obligated to obey. They were broken up into two divisions, and you had proponents on each side. Well, these are the most important ones. And then you had others say, no, 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 those aren't the most important commandments out of the 613. These are the most important commandments out of the 613. And so this scribe says, I know who to ask now. If I want to get a definitive answer, nobody can seem to agree. I'm just going to ask Jesus, what's the greatest commandment out of all of them? Which commandment is the most important of them all? Verse 29, Jesus answered, the most important is, and now you'll notice he's quoting. He's not making this up. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And immediately, if you were a Jew, even today, you would immediately recognize Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And this is the Shema. Every pious Jew would wake up every morning and they would quote Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And every night before they went to bed, they would quote Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It was a great declaration of monotheism. We know there are many gods perpetrated in society, but there's really only one true God. There's only one true living God. He is Yahweh. He is the Lord, our God. And so Jesus points them to their own scriptures and says, here is the most important command. And then he continues by quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Notice that in Mark 12, verse 30. And you, he's still quoting, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus says, you want to know what the most important command is? You want, to, you want a Cliff Notes version of the Bible? Do you want to just cut to the chase and find out what is the first priority, the first obligation, the first expectation upon every person who is serious about living for God, it is this. You start with God. You start with God. If you're trying to figure out the priorities of your life, start with God. If you're trying to figure out the problems and the puzzles and the perplexities of your life, start with God. And when you start with God, you start with loving Him. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. God has to be number one in your life. Your love for God must be supreme. It must be the greatest love of your life. It must be the supreme love of all the loves of your life. I remember years ago seeing a book on a used bookstore. And the book was titled, Looking Out for Number One. And I thought, who needs a book? To know how to look out for number one. We're all pretty good at loving ourselves first and being self-centered and self-focused and our, watching out for our own self-interest. We need a book that says, no, don't look out for number one if you are the number one. God has to be number one in your life. And maybe you're thinking, that, wait a minute, that sounds a little egotistical that God would expect me to love him supremely? Well, if it came from anyone else in your life, that would be an egotistical thing to do, and that person would need counseling. 
If anybody in your life walks up to you and says, you love me first and you love me best and you love me most, then you got a problem. That's an unhealthy relationship. But what makes this natural is the one who is saying, love me with everything you've got, is none other than the one true living God who created you, brought you into this world. He not only demands your love, he deserves your love. He deserves your love because that air you're breathing in your lungs is a gift from God. That heart that beats in your chest is a gift from God. That food that sustains you is a gift from God. This world in which you enjoy is a gift from God. He is God and he deserves our love. But greater than the fact that he is our creator, he is our redeemer. He is our sustainer. He is the one who loved us first. The one who is asking you to love him supremely is the one who loved you initially. Don't you remember that verse of scripture in 1 John chapter 4 where John says, we love him because he first loved us. And today in the 21st century, we've got the hindsight of church history. We've got the hindsight of an earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. We've got the hindsight of the cross of Calvary and an empty tomb. And we can see the greatest demonstration of God's love for us displayed in the gift of his own son, Jesus, who died for us even when we were not lovely. He died for us sinners when he went to the cross of Calvary. That is why Jesus said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus says, you want to get your priorities straight? You want to know what should be number one in your life? You know what the first importance and obligation for you is? You love God supremely. You've got to put God first in your life. And if you love yourself, your pleasures, your plans, your priorities, your politics, your personal preferences more than you love God, then those things have become idols to you. There's only one who deserves first place in our lives, and that is God himself. And so Jesus says, let's cut to the chase. You love God supremely. But he's not finished. Like any good preacher, he gives you more than you asked for. He he, he gives you a little extra. So he goes on in verse 31. The second is this. Now, the scribe didn't ask about what is the first and second greatest commandment. He only asked about the first. But Jesus says, you can't have one without the other. The first actually leads you to the second. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here he's quoting from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And listen, if there is not a verse of scripture for us to hear today where we are in America, politically speaking, it is this verse. Leviticus 19 verse 18, Jesus is giving us a a summary of that verse. The whole verse says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. God says. And so Jesus says, now before you say to the first commandment, amen, Jesus, that is so right. You know, I've been telling these guys this the whole time. I I told them, yeah, it's going to be Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. That's got to be the greatest. And you know, I do a pretty good job at that. God is first in my life. I've dedicated my life to Christian ministry, or in their case, to Judaic ministry. And I'm a full-time minister I've told them you got to love God with everything you got. And Jesus says, time out. It is easy to say you love God with everything you've got. But the real test of your love for God is do you love people? Because you cannot love God if you don't love people created by God, created in the image of God. It is pious nonsense, John would say in 1 John chapter 4, to say, I love God whom you've never seen with your eyes while you hate your brother whom you have seen. And you want to know why so many people have checked out of Christianity? It is not because of Jesus. 
It's because of people who claim the name Jesus. And they see the hatred and the animosity and the racism and the division and the ugliness. And it says to them, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want any part of it. Because they claim to love God, but they seem to hate me. And Jesus says, the second most important command is that you love your neighbor as yourself. Our problem with this verse is, we often start with trying to love our neighbor. And when you start by trying to be a good follower of God, by first trying to love your neighbor, and you forget about the first commandment to love God, you're going to be in trouble. Because by the time you start loving your neighbor, your neighbor is going to get on your nerves. Your neighbor is going to put their fence a little far into your property line. Your neighbor, you don't know who they are, but they just cut you off in traffic. And your first response is not, Lord bless them, Lord love them. Maybe one gun salute to say good morning, but it's not to love them. That, that family member who voted differently than you, you look at them with disgust and you say, it's so hard to love somebody who liked who like that person that I don't like. It's hard to always love your coworker. It's always, this is going to be scandalous. <laughs> it's sometimes hard to love your kids. Woo, sometimes, man, they can just grate your last nerve. Am I right? And all you people that don't have kids, well, I can't believe he said that. I used to have three. Never mind, I'm going to keep preaching. I've got my kids in here. I'm not going to say anymore. I love my kids. But sometimes it was, it was a choice of the will. Sometimes it's hard to love your spouse. Don't say amen if they're sitting in the room. You see, the problem is we start there, but where I have to start, where Jesus tells us we must start, is not in just going out, and I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to try my hardest to love my neighbor, and I'm going to grip my tongue and my, my teeth, and I'm going to do it. No, 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 that's not love, friend. You, love's going to hurt you if you keep loving like that. You start with loving God first. When you realize how much God loves you, when you realize how much God is patient with you, when you realize how merciful God is with you, when you realize how much grace God allows you in your life, you then can respond to his great love with loving your neighbor. Our focus must be on God because only then can we love our neighbors like we're supposed to love each other. If I start treating you like you treat me, or you treat me like I treat you, then we are doomed. The only thing that happens in a world where, where it's eye for eye and tooth for tooth is we're blind and toothless. Jesus says, love God first. Get your eyes on him and his great love for you. and Receive that love, but then respond to his great love by loving your neighbor as yourself. Love someone, treat someone like you want to be treated in your own life. Whenever I sin, I want people to say, well, you know, he's not perfect. You know, he's human. Whenever I sin, I want people to say, you know, we got to forgive that boy. But whenever you sin, how could they do that? Sorry, dog, I tell you what, I don't know what they were thinking. Isn't it interesting how we want to be treated one way, but then we don't want to treat other people that way? Jesus says, no, love your neighbor like you love yourself. You know what Jesus is doing? Jesus is summarizing, he is condensing the Ten Commandments, and he's condensing those 613 commandments down to these two. And in the Ten Commandments, we see it illustrated that there are really two tablets to the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments are are vertical. They, they control our relationship with God. There is no other God. You should have no other God before me. Make no graven image. Don't take my name in vain and keep the Sabbath day holy. And then the remaining six of those Ten Commandments are horizontal. They impact our relationships with each other. So once we've got our relationship with God right, now we're in a position to have right relationships with each other. And I think Jesus is saying, your right is wrong. Your R-I-T-E is wrong. Your religion is wrong. If it doesn't lead you to a right relationship with God and with other people. And so how do we treat other people? 
Well, we do what the Ten Commandments tell us. We honor our, our father and mother. We do not murder. We do not commit adultery. We do not steal. We do not bear false witness. And we do not covet what our neighbor has. We wouldn't need 613 laws. And America has the Jews beat. We wouldn't have tens of thousands of laws on our books if we would just do what Jesus told us to do. Love God supremely. Love your neighbor sincerely. All the rest is just the fine print. And our world needs more people who are committed to loving God supremely and loving other people sincerely. The scribe recognizes the value of what Jesus said, the beauty and the excellence of what Jesus said. In verse 32, and the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. Jesus, I'm going to give you an A. You're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. Don't you love this? The scribe is so pious, so humble, he will not use the covenant name of God out of humility. He just substitutes the pronouns he and him, but he's talking about God. You're right, Jesus. Verse 33, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. The scribe says, Jesus, you're right. It's so clear now that all of those sacrificial Ceremonies that we go through as the Jewish people in Old Testament Judaism are worthless if they don't remind us to love God first and supremely and to love our neighbor sincerely. I love verse 34. It says, And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. He says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're just one step away from the kingdom. The kingdom is not about ritual, and it's not about religion. It's about a right relationship with God the Father and with other people. And I think it's Jesus' way as well saying, you're not far from the kingdom of God. I'm standing right here. I am God in flesh. I am the only one who has ever obeyed these two commandments perfectly. And if you hear these two commandments and say, thank you, I can do that, then you've missed it because you can't do it. No one has done it perfectly except me, the son of God. And Christianity is not built on a works religion. It's built on the work of Jesus and what he did in loving God supremely and loving others sincerely and I come to him in repentance and saying Jesus I'm sorry I've not loved God like I should I'm sorry I've not loved other people like I should and I'm not going to stand here and claim I ever can this side of heaven but please I stake my soul on you do for me what I can't do now you're in the kingdom now you understand what God's been trying to say to you and teach you come to Jesus He's the only one who ever perfectly lived out the two great commandments. And he would in just a few hours demonstrate it. He humbly obeyed his heavenly father by going to the cross of Calvary, not as a victim, but as a volunteer. And he gave his life not only in obedience to his father, but in substitute for you and for me. Because he loved us first after God. Verse 34 says, after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. <laughs> the scribes and Pharisees say, "Woo, we were close to losing one of our own to him. We better stop asking questions. We're going to lose more. And no one asked any questions. But the bottom line is simple. Love God supremely. Love others sincerely. It's why our church's mission statement is we exist to glorify God the Father by helping people. Love God, love others, and serve the world. That's why we're here. This is where we get it. Today, whenever you go out of this place or you go into your relationships or tomorrow you go to work, ask yourself the question, what does love require of me? What does love for God and love for my neighbor look like in this moment? And God, I can't love like I'm supposed to, but would you, by your grace and your strength, 
help me to love you supremely. More than my personal preferences, more than my politics, more than my, my plans or my priorities, let me love you supremely and let me love my neighbors sincerely. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we can only respond with a heart of gratitude and joy and thanksgiving that you have given to us so richly of your love. You've given us this world in which we live. You've given us our lives. You've given us every good gift that we have in life. It all comes from you. and We thank you for it. But most supremely, you've given us your son Jesus who died for us on the cross of Calvary as our sacrifice, as our substitute. He took our punishment there on the cross of Calvary. And he demonstrated what loving God supremely and loving neighbors sincerely looks like. It's an obedient love, tangible and sacrificial and selfless. And God, we admit that we've not loved you like we should and we've not loved others like we should. Instead, we indulge our selfishness. We become focused on us and our agendas and we forget how great we've been loved by you. So we thank you that you're willing to forgive when we repent and you're willing to restore us and you're willing to help us to experience your great love in a measure that can then be expressed to others. God, would you make us more mindful of other people and loving and patient and considerate. But let it flow not out of just trying harder, but let our love flow out of our overwhelming sense of love from you. Help us to know you more, to focus on you more, to get our eyes on you more to worship you more, to talk to you more in prayer, to read your scriptures more. With every part of our being, let you be the supreme love of our lives. Then and only then can we live out that love for neighbor. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. And God, if there's someone in this room today who doesn't know Jesus as their personal Savior, I pray right now, God, in the stillness of this moment, they would receive your great gift of love by turning from their sin, believing on Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, and let him come into their life. And God, you promised whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So right now, may they call on Jesus. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Thank you for loving me. Help me to love you more, and help me to love my neighbor more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much, and I thank you for being here. If we can help you in any way, you reach out and let us know.